we've been looking at relationship habits over the last few weeks and I think we can all agree that in our day and age that's very important some very important things to be addressing in how we relate to each other because I know from the ages we have from the youngest to the oldest we've all had our issues I know we've all experienced difficulties in relationships I think all of us has also, as we look, look around us today, realise that there are many things that are trying to bring division into our lives, um, into society and into the church as well. And the, the world wants us to be all about me, you know, me, my things, my rights. I want to make sure my story is known, which actually ends up setting us as individual kings and queens all over the place with our own little kingdoms. But what that means is if we meet someone else who has their little kingdom and their rules, our rules don't always match. Well, they don't match, do they? So we have conflict. So we don't want to be individual kings and queens. We want to be the control of our King God, Jesus Christ. That's the gospel and the kingdom that we want. And we, if we are together under him, then we are more united than divided. But the point is, yes, this is a great time to make sure we're working alongside our Heavenly Father and trying to dispel those selfish, divisive things and replace them with God's things like truth, godly character, which leads us to those better relationship habits. And perhaps even we can get to healing some of those relationships that we have perhaps are damaged with family or friends that we had before. Now, I'm not going to try and promise any amazing quick fixes today but I do pray that over the next couple of weeks we can as we look at these ideas of forgiveness and reconciliation that God will be gracious enough to uh, to use my words to help someone who might be struggling in a relationship or two even or three or whatever at the moment and bring some healing as we look at how God's word informs us about his, his forgiveness of us and how that should inform ours so yes it's that key element of relationships forgiveness today as Carl explained to us. So this is our principle for today. It's that in Christ, we as the church need to be characterised by forgiveness. So it needs to be such a natural part of us that when people look at the church from outside, or our church especially if we can, that they say, gee, they're really a forgiving kind of people. So that's, to be characterised like that would mean that people see us that way from the outside. So as we begin our journey to help us see that and grasp how this fits into the big picture of the Christian life, let's look at something that's been fundamental to the series so far, this, the idea of being in Christ. Now we've mentioned in Christ most times in, the last, in this series, most days. But what does it mean to say that we're in Christ? Well, let's think of two main aspects that I'd like us to look at. And one is that by faith we are in Christ. So think of it like in the family, in the arms of Jesus, or in the arms of God, and Jesus is our brother. We are in Christ, we're within the bounds of the family and his eternal life. And the other is that, again, by faith, Christ should be in us too, filling us and filling our lives. But hang on, how does that work? How can we be in Christ and Christ in us? try and picture that you get a bit tangled in your, in your mind but let me try and help with the tangling and try and untangle something so let's use this illustration this is what I, I did at my previous church we actually did an activity that w- was an object lesson kind of idea plus it was a bit of a game minute to win it type thing this is where we had two people standing side by side each of them had a collection of balls and there were two specific kind of balls kind of pictures of them up there so one was a a whole pile of little foam balls and the other one was ping pong balls table tennis balls and you had lots of those and the, the idea was to throw them alternate one after the other so one of the ping pong balls one of the foam balls and try and fill up a jug of water and there's, sorry there's a jug of water that's full of water um, try and fill the top of that jug and get as many as you can in there in a minute and see who can win as you do this you discover that there is a difficulty if you put too many table tennis balls into the jug because they begin to block the other balls from getting in there so they're floating on the top getting in the way so okay how is that an object lesson I'll try and explain it 
Well, if the water represents Jesus Christ and his spirit, then we can see that both kinds of balls would be, um, would be, could be in Christ, right? They could all land in within the boundary, if you think the top of the, the jug is the boundary. That could be in Christ. But only the sponge balls would then get Christ in them because they absorb the water and they sink. And you could say they go deeper. That's the way to probably to phrase it. Which is obviously more desirable because then they're not in the way of more balls coming in. And they don't repel the other balls as they land. So all can be in Christ. That's what we're saying. It doesn't matter what, whether you're more like the sponge ball or the table tennis ball. We can all be in Christ. But it's the nature of the person themselves which determines to what degree Christ gets into them and fills his or her life. And all believers are somewhere on that spectrum from the hard ping pong ball to the soft and absorbent foam ball. Um, We're all within that range somewhere. So the point is we need to be more like the sponge ball. That's okay. I think it's okay to aspire to be like a sponge ball in in this case anyway. So we need to be in Christ, but we also need to have Christ in us. And if we do that, then rather than repel others, we will encourage others, and together we will go deeper and have better fellowship, better koinonia, as Pastor Larry spoke about a couple of weeks ago. So with that idea in our minds, let's uh, have a bit of a discussion about forgiveness. And that's the the fundamental part of these relationship habits that we need to work on today. If we are in Christ, we need to be growing in the arts, and it's really the discipline, of forgiveness. And of course, the best example we have of forgiveness is God himself, right? That's uh, quite clear. He sets the pattern that we should follow when it comes to how to forgive other people. After all, it's only because of the forgiveness that Jesus offers us that we can be in Christ at all. Uh, It's his grace in that area. So since we've been recipients of the greatest amazing forgiveness that's on offer anywhere, we should be be developing that kind of forgiveness to others as our response to him forgiving us and passing it on. And many of us may be familiar of the parable Jesus told of the unforgiving servant. That's him there with his hands around the other guy's neck. Because uh, very briefly, he, he was forgiven a massive debt by his master. But then he immediately went out and demanded that what, someone who owed him a much less debt pay him back straight away. So he's an example of someone who failed to truly grasp the depth of the true forgiveness extended to him. And, and thus he didn't pass it on to others. Okay, so how... Do we make sure we get it, that we become more characterised as a forgiving person and a forgiving church? How do we get to that? Well, here's an example of someone who's only slightly further on that journey than the guy in Jesus' parable here. And this is a true story, by the way. It happened a little while ago now, and it involves a man whose name was Frederick Lonsdale. Let me read it to you. It's very brief. In one New Year's Eve at London's Garrick Club... British dramatist Frederick Lonsdale was asked by Seymour Hicks to reconcile with a fellow member. They had an argument, obviously. The two had quarrelled in the past and never restored their friendship. You must, Hicks said to Lonsdale. It's very unkind to be unfriendly at such a time. Go over now and wish him a happy new year. So Lonsdale crossed the room and spoke to his enemy. I wish you a happy new year. But only one. So... Clearly his heart was not in his blessing, but he was, as we say, obeying the letter of the law, but not the spirit of the law. You see the difference there? It makes a big difference in your actions and your words. But many of us do the same thing, don't we? we? We try and forgive, but it's really just superficial or grudging, and we really keep hold of our grudge. But the way to keep it, or to help it get deeper into us, is to become more of who we already are as God's children, and to keep our minds set on the amazing forgiveness that God offers us through Jesus Christ. If we get a true appreciation of the magnitude of God's forgiveness, it will put our little puny gripes in perspective. 
Okay, so for a moment, let's try and get a better idea of God's forgiveness. Let's try and understand that a bit better. So let's try and firstly, by doing that, uh, to, to do that is to define it biblically. It's our goal first. What is forgiveness? Now, the Hebrew version of the word usually translated forgive carries with it the idea of lifting off, taking off, um, carrying up, lifting a weight. While the Greek word is more the idea of loosing or releasing or taking off the shackles or the handcuffs like in that picture there. So if you combine those thoughts together, the overall concept is really the idea of releasing someone from the weight of guilt caused by their sin against you. You release them of that. And as I'm sure we've all heard and we know in theory that when we release someone else, it's just as much a weight off our shoulders too. As the saying goes, um, to forgive is to set a prisoner free and discover that the prisoner was you. So there's a definitely a two-way thing here and this will become more clear as we go through. But it's also just as true like that you're forgiving others but you're also um, you're releasing yourself but you are also forgiving others and that you're releasing them from a burden and lifting the weight from their shoulders. And of course the best way to grasp that is to see what God's done for us. So if you turn in your Bibles to Ephesians 4 verse 32 do a little bit of jumping around today, and they're all on the screen, but it's always good to have your own Bible in front of you too, so you're used to flipping to where things are. So in this verse we see that it's the pattern for forgiveness has been set by God. Ephesians 4.32 says, Be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, as God in Christ forgave you. Now there's an assumption there behind the last part of that verse and that's the fact that we all have something to be forgiven for. Now there are many today who might want to argue that point. A lot of people are going around saying, I'm a pretty good person. No, I haven't done anything really wrong. It's only when you, get, you have to murder someone or when you murder someone or something, that's when you need real forgiveness. But I think that's to misunderstand God's standard, isn't it? What's God's standard? It's perfection. It's right up here. And we know all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Romans 3.23 So it's fundamental that we understand that we are in need of forgiveness. And we're not just in need of forgiveness, we're in desperate need of forgiveness. I hope we can grasp that idea. Because without it, we're going to have an eternity condemned without God. Which is just a, a horrific thought, and I hope... That sits in your heart one day, you understand what the options are. That should drive us to reach others too. But uh, to even be saved, we need to acknowledge that sobering truth, that each of us has deeply offended a holy God. But there is good news, isn't it? Good gospel means good news. This is the good news, that he has absolutely done something to fix the problem. So what's he done? Well, now that's when we can go to our... Most famous verse in the Bible, John 3.16. I know you all know it, but let's see it again because I think it says it all. And these are, as we read Jesus' own words here, For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. So Jesus is God's hand of forgiveness extended towards us. He came to us in a person. Now he's personal, he's loving, he's compassionate, and he's also perfectly righteous and holy. But all those things are in the right hand of God coming to us to bring us to himself. So now we'll pick up on that idea of Jesus being the hand of God. Um, we have just done it, but we're going to pick it up again later. But for now, I want to see how he can offer that. Because if you think about it, God is too holy to just say, in, in the surface of it, to just say, if you're sorry, I will not count your sin. Because he really can't just ignore it. A holy God with infinite knowledge, he cannot and will not do that. He has to deal with the sin somehow, or he's not being just. And this is where I can link back to the sermon I spoke a couple of months ago when we talked about redemption. This is how God can be just and merciful at the same time with the process of redemption. It's only if he takes the sin on himself and takes away our guilt that forgiveness can be offered to us. So that's why the cross and Jesus is so central. 
So this is what Jesus means when, in John 3.16 there when he says that God gave his only son. He's speaking of himself, of course, there. And God gave him. He gave him on the cross and he died paying the penalty for the sin that we could never pay for ourselves. And to help us unlock this idea of what that forgiveness entails a bit more um, thickly, making that word up maybe, um, is Romans 4.25. So please turn with me as well to that because I find this so helpful and I think this really undergirds all of forgiveness. God's to us and then ours to others in response to that because ours derives from his ultimately. So please take note of this. Romans 4.25 says this, speaking of course of Jesus, that he was delivered up for our trespasses and raised for our justification. And for a long time I read this verse and and it just was kind of words, and then I sort of sat with it a bit, and a few things have come out. So firstly, I think this little verse bridges everything in terms of forgiveness and also reconciliation, which we'll focus on more next week, God willing. But you might notice there are two parts there. The first part is that he was delivered up for our trespasses. And of course, trespasses can also be translated sins, so the idea of trespass is to cross the line, to go somewhere you shouldn't go. And then the delivered up part, that's a reference to the whole event of his crucifixion and even beyond really to, to probably his resurrection, is all in there, the whole giving of himself for us. But I hope you get that point there. He died so that all of our sin, past, present and future, so yes, your future sins also covered, so that would all be paid for, it would be dealt with, it would be taken away as far as the east is from the west. And that's as far as you can get. <laughs> Okay, so that's amazing. That's God's taken our sin. But that's only part of the story. So we might be pardoned for our sin, but we're not spiritually alive yet to enjoy that living in that pardon. So that situation is kind of like these things called posthumous pardons that you might have heard. American presidents have the power to do this. They give someone a pardon just because they want to. And sometimes they do it for people who have died. I think it's just to sort of correct the record or whatever they choose to do. But that's what they, they say. They, you know, this person, they're now guilt, not guilty of their crime anymore, their crime or their crimes. So, you know, that's a nice gesture. But how much do you reckon it actually helps the dead person? Not really at all. Okay, well, it has no effect on them. So I, I'd say that because I want to try and draw that analogy there, that for God's pardon to have an effect on us, we need to be able to have life to receive the benefit of that. And yes, there is some in this life, benefits of course, but if we're going to enjoy living in his forgiveness eternally, we have to be living eternally. So there's a problem. That's where the second half of the verse comes in. It says, he was raised for our justification. And there's a whole lot behind the word justification, but the idea there is he is eternal life personified, Jesus, he rose again and now offers that eternal life in himself to all who will re truly receive it. And that's when we're justified. That's the first step in our born again salvation experience. So it's only if we receive him that we can be made alive to live life eternally with him. I hope that makes sense. We have to be alive. Being pardoned means nothing without the life to experience it. You're just a dead body. So it's those two elements. The dealing with the sin in his death and the offer of eternal life through his own, that really is the substance of the forgiveness on offer. So you can see it's really, it's a big thing. It's got a lot to it. And okay, some may say, but if we're spiritually dead, how can we accept that forgiveness and choose to accept and receive eternal life? Well, we need to be careful how we define spiritual death. We're not spiritual corpses before we're saved. If you think of your spirit as laying flat like that, it's, it's more the idea that Death is really a separation. We're separated from the light. But yeah, we are separated from the light of Christ when we're born. Uh, sorry, that's the next part. Sorry, I'm trying to be clever there. It didn't work. But the physical death in our souls, in our souls we are separated from our body for a time. That's, that's when we die. But then in spiritual death, the state in which we're all born... Our spirits are separated from God. That's the separation in, in view there. 
and he's the source of eternal life. So we don't have that eternal life because we're separated from him. But even in that state, our separated spirits aren't comatose. We are able to detect and respond to the call of God's spirit in our lives. And we are thus responsible for that decision, whether we say yes or no to him. I know there are some who take issue with that, but I hope you can at least consider what I'm saying. I think this, this does work when you take the whole Bible. Because otherwise we need spiritual regeneration before faith, and I think that's not what the Bible teaches. So, anyway, the point is that Jesus has done everything necessary for us to come into relationship with him. I think we can all agree on that. He's dealt with our sin, and he offers us that costly forgiveness and eternal life if we come to him in faith. Okay, so there's the background from the Bible. Let's see how this helps us practically in forgiving others. Now, as I said before, that is the pattern we need to follow, more or less. That's God sets the pattern for us. Now, granted, we don't need to die for someone else to be forgiven, but we do follow that pattern in that we need to give something up if we're going to offer forgiveness to someone else. Because we need to give up our pride and perhaps our desire to have the moral high ground over someone else. Because there are some who might say, no, oh, she did wrong by me and I'm, I'm going to feel superior to her because she's in, you know, um, I'm, I'm morally superior because she is in the wrong here and I'm clearly right. And I can still be a victim too. I can claim victim status with this because she's um, done this to me. But no, Jesus' example shows us that holding on to the victim status is not good. So I'll give that up too. Even though in this world, or you've probably seen if you haven't been hiding under a rock or asleep the whole time, that this world is actually driving us to claim victim status in so many ways, they encourage and reward those who do so. You probably think of examples coming to your head now. But that's of the world, and we are not of the world, and so we mustn't live like that any, anymore. We are not a victim because Christ died for us. Jesus, he humbled himself to go as far as dying for his enemies, which is us. And we need to humble ourselves and forgive ours. So grudges and unforgiveness are, as we said before, not just damaging for relationships and for church unity. It's kind of saying the same thing there. But they are poisonous to our own souls because they help us or make us prideful and, and selfish as we look down on others who are sinners in our eyes because we're better than them. So just as God has forgiven us, we need to forgive others. And yes, that's a very high bar. And yes, we will sometimes fail or probably often fail to reach it. But it is the example that God has set for us and which we can see that and we can see in that the grace and mercy that we are just being just so blessed to receive from God. And so how can we seek to be any different, I guess is what I'm trying to say, because that's how we've been shown it. Otherwise, we're being like the unmerciful servant that we saw before. So, yes, just like Jesus is the right hand of forgiveness graciously, graciously extended for, to us from God, we need to extend the hand of forgiveness to others as well. So can I challenge you right at this point? Is there someone that God might be putting on your mind right now that you know you need to forgive? And perhaps those who go to the marriage course, uh, maybe that has sparked something in your, in your heart or in your mind that you need to sort out with your spouse. And you might have been thinking about it since last week and going, but I can't do it. But no, we need to do it. Whatever it is, if God is speaking to you about the issue, please don't leave it till tomorrow. Deal with it today. Make the move today. And yes, even if you think that they should make the first move. They, well, they offended me, they should make the first move. Again, that's not the pattern that Jesus sets for us, is it? Because what did Jesus do? Did, did he initiate? And how far did he go? Well, Romans 5.8. You don't need to turn there, I'll bring this up for you. God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. So that's going an awful long way. 
dying for us while we were still sinners. That's, and it's what you can call really making the first move because we were stuck. We had no option. He had to make the first move. So is it really too much to ask for you and me to perhaps make the first move in our relationship issues? If we just got to swallow our pride enough to do that? Because Jesus did for us. So please listen to God if he's speaking to you about that today. So yes, the, the next part of forgiveness as we head towards uh, thinking about a bit about next week, just laying a bit of foundation, is the word reconciliation. So I, I want to have a bit of a touch on that. So I want to show you a bit about how forgiveness and reconciliation are linked because they are very much related. And how I see it is that reconciliation, which is the point where the relationship is back together again, so that state of reconciliation is the fulfillment of forgiveness. When you take forgiveness and you bring it to its conclusion, that is reconciliation. You can say it's the goal of forgiveness or the fulfillment of forgiveness. And forgiveness, when it's fully embraced by both sides, results in reconciliation. That's another way of saying it. So what I want to do now is quickly run through what I mean by that with a bit of a graphic representation. Sometimes pictures help, so let's use that. Because you might be feeling, yeah, I know God wants me to do something about this, but what does it look like and how, do, how would it work and how does it all fit in? So let's have a look at that. Now we're going to have two people, A and B. That's their full names, A and B. All right. Here they are, A and B. They are good friends, they're in, in a relationship and they have harmony. So that's a lovely thing to have, harmony. But then life happens, uh, there's some bad decisions are made and person A wrongs person B. So that they come into an offence, so they do something that's offensive to them. And the result of that, that offence, is that there is now alienation between person A and person B. And some people are going, yes, I know how this works. <laughs> I've experienced that myself. So they're in the situation where they, they don't talk anymore and the relationship is broken. Now this is an uncomfortable situation to be in, isn't it? And the vast majority of us, and in fact it's probably all of us here, um, have at least some idea how this feels. And it's not very nice. And it can affect a lot of our lives, depending on how close the two people are. And let's get right into the, the core of it. Husband and wife, if that's the situation with husband and wife, that's huge, right? And those who have been through that, or if you're going through that at the moment, even you don't need me, you don't need me to tell you how horrible it is. And think about, it's bad for the couple, but it's also bad for the, the immediate family. It's bad for the extended family. It's, it's difficult, right? We all know it's hard. So what can be done? Well, if neither party does anything, things just go on, parallel lines, you know, separate, nothing's going to change. Some might think, you know, time heals all wounds, and there's some truth in that. But in reality, until you deal with the underlying issues, then it's not going to be resolved. So what we need to do is what God did for us. Again, look at his example and follow his example. We need to reach out in forgiveness. So in our scenario here, since A offended B, we'll say that B reaches out in forgiveness towards person A. But of course this can be initiated from the other side too. Uh, person A can make the first move. But in our example, it's B reaching out to A. So suppose they just, you know, they pick up a phone or they organise a coffee and they say, listen, we need to talk this out. Uh, I, I believe you wronged me and here's how, and, but I'm here to say I'm ready to forgive you. Now I know there are all kinds of complexities in this and, and it's never straightforward, it's never just that simple, but we'll talk more about that next week, God willing. But today we just want to look, work with the overview. So in this situation, the person offers forgiveness and then person A admits their guilt and they reach out their hand and they shake hands, figuratively speaking, or maybe literally even, perhaps. And as I said before, it could be that the admission of guilt happens first from person A and then person B forgives them. I just chose to present it this, this way because that's what happens between God and us. He offers forgiveness. But the important thing is 
There is humility and a will to reconcile expressed on both sides. And the problems are worked through once that has happened. Oh, so in, in the process of this happening, sorry. And then, and then once the issues have been addressed, the main issues at least, and then we come back to a position of reconciliation. But what does that mean really, reconciliation? Well, it means there's, there's no animosity, enmity left. And as far as this issue goes, the two parties have agreed not to hold anything against each other. That's really the, the key idea there. Now, I just want to deal with the idea of forgive and forget. There, there, is, uh, that, there is some truth in forgive and forget. And it sounds nice and snappy and easy to say, but it's, sometimes that's not always pr- not practical or even necessarily helpful. And I just want to quote a lady called Eva Kaur, a Holocaust survivor. She said this, How on earth could anybody forget their whole family was murdered? That's stupid. People remember, but the way you remember and why you remember should be different. That's the key idea there. The way you remember and why you remember should be different. So it's not so much forgive and forget as forgive and not hold against. Because you're not going to go and someone who's recovering from alcohol, forgive them for what they've done, but you don't go and put alcohol in front of them again if they're an alcoholic. So you've got to keep that in your mind. You're not trying to tempt anyone or make it difficult. So that's more the idea of forgive and not hold against. Okay, so that's when we get to reconciliation, once we get to that stage. But that doesn't necessarily mean you're best buddies again, does it? Just because you've made up, there's still underlying things that need to be healed. So to restore from that point on, you need to rebuild trust. So that takes a long time. It can do. And again, that's like God with us. For those of us who are justified in Christ, we are reconciled to God, but we are now in the phase of developing that relationship with him. Our trust is building in our God. Our faith is growing. That's ideally what should be happening. Or as to take the image of the the jug thing I talked about before, we are in Christ. We are are learning how to have Christ in us. We are learning how to let him absorb into us, in a sense. Because he is the one, Christ is the one who is the way to the Father. And as we grow in that, and as we learn just how much we've been forgiven, we grow in the love of God, and it will in turn flow out from us to others in our forgiveness of them and in all kinds of other good things in life flow out of this change. Now, it just so happens that this coming week has been deemed Reconciliation Week by, say, the powers that be. Now, we didn't know that that when we planned our sermon... um, plan ahead but I guess that's God's timing so it works out nicely so since we've talked about this now you've got this chart in your mind as we go through reconciliation week when things happen just keep in mind uh, how this might apply and how do we achieve reconciliation there's something that might be missing so keep just have a think this week okay so just to wrap up this morning I've touched on the story of a lady called Eva Kaur before as a survivor of the Nazi holocaust But there's another famous story of forgiveness out of that time, and it's a lady many of you have heard of. Her name's Corrie Ten Boom. She's no longer with us, but uh, this was a picture of her later in life. And yes, I know many of you would probably have read her account um, or heard her story, but it struck me fresh this week. It's just an amazing testimony of the forgiveness of God working through someone who's really struggling to forgive. So if that's you, have a listen to her and because um, the world would say to Corey, you know, yeah, you've been such terribly treated, you don't need to forgive, that's just too hard. But God's standard, remember, it's very high, and even though she experienced the worst of the worst, she still uh, knew she had to forgive. So as I'm going to close with this, and I hope you can see the goodness of God working through her in this story. So just for um, context here, she was uh, at a church, it was two years after World War II, this particular episode she's going to describe, and her and her sister Betsy had been in a German concentration camp. And after Corrie had been released, she travelled around speaking in churches about forgiveness. That was her main point. And at one of these talks, which was actually in Germany, she recognised a man who had been one of the guards at the camp that she was at. 
So she describes the point where she comes face to face with this man. And can you just put yourself in her shoes for a moment, just imagine that. And uh, here is how it went. Now he was in front of me, hand thrust out. A fine message, Fräulein. How good is it to know that, as you say, all our sins are at the bottom of the sea. And I, who had spoken so glibly of forgiveness, fumbled in my pocketbook, rather than take that hand. He would not remember me. How could he remember one prisoner among those thousands of women? But I remembered him and the leather crop swinging from his belt. It was the first time since my release that I had been face to face with one of my captors and my blood seemed to freeze. You mentioned Ravensbrook in your talk, he was saying. I was a guard there. So no, he did not remember me. But since that time, he went on, I've become a Christian. I know that God has forgiven me for the cruel things I did there. But I would like to hear it from your lips as well, Fräulein. Again, the hand came out. Will you forgive me? And I stood there. I, whose sins had every day to be forgiven, and I could not. Betsy had died in that place. Could he erase her slow, terrible death simply for the asking? Again, that's the idea of forgive and forget. doesn't quite apply. I could not have been sitting there many seconds with his hand held out, but to me it seemed hours as I wrestled with the most difficult thing I'd ever had to do. For I had to do it. I knew that. The message that God forgives has a prior condition that we forgive those who have injured us. If you do not forgive men their trespasses, Jesus says, neither will your Father in heaven forgive your trespasses. I knew it not only as a commandment of God, but as a daily experience. Since the end of the war, I had, a, I had had a home in Holland for the victims of Nazi brutality. Those who were able to forgive their former, former enemies were able to return to the outside world and rebuild their lives. This is some of the social effects of forgiveness on yourself. So they were able to rebuild their lives no matter what the physical scars. But those who nursed their bitterness remained invalids. It was as simple and horrible as that. And still I stood there with the coldness clutching my heart. But forgiveness is not an emotion. I knew that too. Forgiveness is an act of the will. And the will can function regardless of the temperature of the heart. Jesus, help me, I prayed silently. I can lift my hand. I can do that much. You supply the feeling. And so, woodenly, mechanically, I thrust my hand into the one stretched out to me. And as I did, an incredible thing took place. The current started in my shoulder and raced down my arm, sprang into our joined hands, and then this healing warmth seemed to flood my whole being, bringing tears to my eyes. I forgive you, brother, I cried, with all my heart. For a long moment we grasped each other's hands. The former guard and the former prisoner, I'd never known God's love so intensely as I did then. And having learned thus to forgive in this hardest of situations, I never again had difficulty in forgiving. I wish I could say it, so she wasn't meaning that. I wish I could say it. I wish I could say that merciful, charitable thoughts just naturally flowed from me from then on. But they didn't. So this is what I'd like you to take home from today. If there's one thing I've learned at 80 years of age, it's that I can't store up good feelings and behaviour, but only draw them fresh from God each day. So it's that relationship with God that we must have. So let's be more like that. Let me pray. Father God, we just thank you for your incredible forgiveness. Lord, it humbles us, it, it amazes us, but it also should inspire us. Help us, Lord, to live more like that. This example, that, well, there's various examples we've seen today, Lord, but the one of Jesus on the cross is the ultimate. So Lord, help us to, to live in that forgiveness day, day by day and to glorify you as we do so. And help us in our relationship with others. Please show us where we need to, to forgive others and give us the strength to do that. In Jesus' name, amen.